Now, I want to turn back to you, Dr. Cronulla, for a second. And, and you mentioned that during the, the mid-century and particularly in the 1960s, there was an expansion of the soundscape across genres. And I think that brings us to the composer Margaret Bonds, who wrote one of the pieces in this series called Montgomery Variations. Uh, Margaret Bonds, uh, for, for those listeners who may not know much about her, um, was very prolific and I think stylistically eclectic uh, are a couple of ways to describe her musicianship. And so Dr. Canola, could you say a little bit more about who Margaret Bonds was and what was her own relationship to this mid-century movement? Before I, uh, I answer that question, can I, can I say something about the point you just made about the representation of the orchestra and the piano? Because I think that in many ways it mirrors what was the um, act of freedom singing that we equate um, with sonically as our consciousness about the movement. You know, most of the singing took place in these mass meetings and it was rooted in black congregational traditions where you had someone leading the song, but it really was the body, the masses of voices coming collectively together. That was the transformational power of that music. And so when you, you were speaking about um, the relationship of the piano and the orchestra in this work of James, you know, it, it brought that to my mind because, you know, it's one of the ways in which this continuum of sound of freedom singing that has stretched from slavery until now can be heard uh, and, mm. and can be recognized. Now, in relation to your question about Margaret Bond, so Margaret Allison Bond was born in 1913 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, she's born into an ecosystem in Chicago that is rooted in civic engagement and activism in Black intellectual activity. In fact, her mother, Margaret Bonds, and her father were activists, but also advocates and promoters of musical culture. Her mother was a celebrated organist, but also a teacher. And Margaret Bonds grew up in this bubble of Black exceptionalism, embodies everything that we think about as a child prodigy, and eventually made her way to Northwestern University, where she received a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, had set out on a vision of being a concert pianist, but was also influenced influenced by the ecosystem she existed in to pursue composition. So she, you know, embodied a space that included Florence Price, William Dawson, uh, William Grant Steele. In fact, Margaret Bonds, in one of the few accounts that she gives, talks about the fact that her mother's home became this epicenter of activity that drew most of the living composers of the early 20th century uh, into her living room space. And so she was uh, surrounded by this intellectual activity and very much was foregrounded by this kind of pan-African intellectuality that, um, you know, saturated Black Chicago in the 1920s and 1930s. And so when we talk about Margaret Bonds in 1963, at the time that she is writing Montgomery's Variations, this is a Margaret Bonds who has um, lived for a couple of decades in New York and been surrounded by individuals who really kind of align with the kind of Black radicalism that comes out of um, the civil rights movement as it begins to take shape uh, in the 1950s. And so, you know, she's very much influenced by uh, Langston Hughes, who is not only a personal friend, but also a collaborator with her. She's influenced by Lorraine Hansberry. She's in the same circles that Odetta is in, uh, also uh, Nina Simone. And so she is surrounded by these uh, intellectuals. And that really frames the consciousness that you will hear in her music. Now, I want to note that Montgomery Variations is one of several pieces from this period of the 50s and 60s that marks really Margaret Bonds's uh, promotion of movement ideology, but really helps frame her as one of the voices of the movement. 
Now, I want to say that with um, deliber deliberation and intentionality because we oftentimes do not think of Black concert artists and composers as being part of the spectrum of protest music, but they very much were. And so Montgomery Variations really encapsulates what I was characterizing uh, earlier about this history of the mid-century civil rights movement. What she tries to capture in this orchestral work is that history. So she is invoking collective memory about the rise of Dr. King, the initiation of the Montgomery movement, and then what has been the subsequent moments uh, within the movement, but what is also the energy and the ethos of the movement. So this is a piece that uh, is written as themes and variation. And the theme is based on uh, the Negro spiritual, I want Jesus to walk with me, which was one of many spirituals that was transformed by movement activists into a freedom song. And so, you know, I want Jesus to walk with me all along this tedious journey, which was what was sung in the black church becomes while I'm on this freedom journey, I want Jesus to walk with me. So she takes this particular theme, one that she would have heard in 1963 when she traveled to Montgomery, Alabama and the surrounding area and immersed herself in the interior of the movement and she uses it as the basis of this orchestral piece, which each of these variations, as I said, offering some lens into the ethos and the activities of the movement. Well, and something that you just said that really stuck out to me is that the, the, there's a prevailing view of, of people who, who haven't done uh, uh, the research that you've done, Dr. Knodel, and I include, I include myself in this. I, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I tend to associate the movement mostly with the South. But I think what, what you said about Black concert artists, um, who, of course, were also living in the South, but in Bonds' case, were living outside it, it shows how it wasn't just a Southern issue. And I think it's really important that that we can see in Detroit, for instance, this Detroit Freedom Walk, that these are really national issues that have a particular locus in points uh, around the South, but that it's really an expansive uh, issue, a national issue, and for that reason includes far more people than we might expect at first. And so this is this is a really important dimension uh, that, that you've brought out for me.